Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see such a wonderful crowd out today. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 Hoyt C. Hoddle Lectureship. And before I formally introduce our distinguished speaker, I'd like to say a few words about Professor Hoyt, after whom this lectureship is named. <coughs> so uh, Hoyt came to MIT from Indiana in 1922 at the age of 19, having just received a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Indiana University. He then uh, received his uh, master's degree in chemical engineering in 1924 from Walt Whitman. And uh, he became the assistant director of the practice school station in Buffalo from 1924 to 1925. And it was after that experience that he became an assistant professor. It was called assistant professor of fuel and gas engineering in 1928. After which he became the full professor of fuel engineering in 1941. In 1965, he became the first Carbon P. Dubs Professor of Chemical Engineering, which he held until his retirement, and he became emeritus in 1968. Now, uh, Professor Hoyto remained active in the department until his death in 1998, even after he had retired. He was a central figure at MIT, and part, particularly in the Department of Chemical Engineering, where he was for 75 years. Hoyt Hoddle will be, will be remembered for his intensity, intellect, and integrity. Uh, in fact, his, uh, he's particularly known by his students. His lectures aim to make students think. He made seminal contributions to the measurement of gas emissivity. He established the mathematical framework for the quantitative treatment of furnaces, the first systematic investigation of the laminar to turbulent transition in diffusion flames, and explored heterogeneous combustion. Professor Hoddle was co-founder with Bernard Lewis and A.J. Nerad of the Combustion Institute. He was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences in 1963, the National Academy of Engineering in 1974, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His professional awards include the U.S. Medal of Merit, the King's Medal for Service in the Cause of Freedom in Great Britain, the Founders Award in the National Academy of Engineering, the Founders Award in the American Institute of Chemical Engineering, the Fritz Medal, United Engineers Trustees, Edgerton Gold Medal, the Combustion Institute, and uh, the William H. Walker Award in AICHE, among many others. Now, uh, Hoyt's general interest was in energy, and a number of his interests are even relevant to this day. Uh, in fact, uh, energy sustainability and climate discussions were one of his favorite things. With funding from Godfrey L. Cabot in 1938, he organized the world's first solar energy utilization research center. And uh, the studies led to the choice of the flat plate collector as the most promising device for solar heating, development of the per performance predicting equations in use today uh, for assessing such collectors and for testing new concepts and ultimately construction of the first solar heated house, which you can see in this image here, and of three others which provided data for economic assessment of solar space heating and hot water supply. Professor Hoddle maintained a balanced view of the significance of solar energy in national or world energy use, advocating the separation of emotional from logical inputs to the assessment of the prospects for economic use of the sun as an energy source. So he was a, a man ahead of his time in that sense. With that, I'm very excited to introduce our Hoyt, our Hoyt C. Hoddle lecturer for 2019, James Dumesic. Now, uh, Jim earned his bachelor's degree from University of Wisconsin-Madison and his master's and PhD degrees from Stanford University under, under the supervision of Professor Michel Boudard. Dumesic joined the Department of Chemical Engineering in 1976, and he's currently the MISEC Distinguished Professor in the College of Engineering and the Michel Boudard Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Jim has co-founded two companies, Virant and Glucan Biorenewables, and pioneered new processes for creating bio-derived fuels and chemicals. He and colleagues at the Wisconsin Energy Institute created an organosolve type process for fractionation of lignocellulosic biomass for production of sugars and lignin that can be converted into biofuels and bioproducts. Now, throughout his career, He's used spectroscopic, microcalular metric, and reaction kinetics techniques to study the surface and dynamic properties of heterogeneous catalysts. Domestic 
pioneered the field of microkinetic analysis in which diverse information from experimental and theoretical studies is combined to elucidate the essential surface chemistry that controls catalyst performance. He's recently studied how aqueous phase reforming of biomass-derived carbohydrates can be tailored to selectively produce hydrogen or directed to produce liquid hydrocarbons. So we have our young Jim Domestic, who uh, <laughs> has been cited throughout his life for his critical work to advance renewable. <laughs> we like the added highlights in your hair, Jim. It's, it's nice. <laughs> He's been cited for his critical work to advance renewable energy from biomass and help society transition from less sustainable resources, which is, makes him an especially appropriate recipient of this lecture award. Over the past 10 years, Domestic and his group have elucidated the fundamental surface chemistry and catalytic conversion. In addition, Domestic and his group have developed new catalytic processing strategies and novel reactor configurations to achieve selective transformation of biomass derived reactants to targeted platform chemical intermediates. And these intermediates have led to uh, the basis for biorefinery in which renewable biomass resources can be converted in a flexible manner to high volume fuels or lower volume high value chemicals and bioplastics. He's also received a variety of awards and honors in the field of catalysis and, catalysis and chemical engineering. In 1998, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. In 2006, he received the Summer J Award for Creative Research and Catalysis from the ACS. In 2007, he was awarded the Burwell National Lectureship by the North American Catalysis Society. In 2008, he received the Hildale Award for Distinguished Professional Accomplishment at University of Wisconsin and he received the inaugural Heinz Heinemann Award by the International Association of Catalysis Societies. He was elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2009, and he was awarded William H. Walker Award uh, in the AICHE for outstanding contributions to chemical engineering literature. In 2011, he received the Michel Boudart um, Award uh, sorry, Award for Advances in Catalysis at the North American Catalysis Meeting and the, at the meeting of the European Federation of Catalysis Societies. In 2012, as shown here, he received the George A. Ola Award in Hydrocarbon or Petro Petroleum Chemistry from the ACS. He was elected to the National Academy of Inventors in 2013 and the National Academy of Sciences in 2014. Very recently, uh, in fact, just this uh, past year, he uh, was awarded the ENI or any award for energy transition, which honors recent research and technological innovation that promote the transition toward low carbon energy systems. He was selected for his pioneering work on novel catalytic processes for converting plant material into advanced fuels, biodegradable plastics, and other renewable chemicals. But Jim is also well known for his outstanding mentorship of graduate students, which is a key part of his legacy in chemical engineering. Many excellent students and post-techs have gone through Domestic's lab. <laughs> Somebody else on the stand, <laughs> including George Huber, who's now a professor at Wisconsin, uh, Michael Emeritus, chancellor now at University of Illinois, Carl Lund, who's chair of Department of Engineering and Education at University of Buffalo, and our very own Yuri Roman. So with that, and with great anticipation, we're going to turn things over to Jim to describe his work. We're very excited to have you here, Jim. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> well, that is, I think, by far the most extensive introduction I've ever, ever heard in my life. So thank you for <laughs> that. Very generous. So uh, obviously, I feel very privileged to have this opportunity to, to speak with you and to come to MIT. There's a, such a tradition here of uh, excellence in chemical engineering. The department right now is the preeminent department, uh, uh, certainly in the country. And uh, Professor Roman right here, I, I can say that about four or five years ago, we were at a North American Catalysis Society meeting. Uh, we went out to dinner, a bunch of former students who are now academics. One of the students had mentioned that I had recently lectured at his institution, and Yuri slammed down his and said it'll be a cold day when domestic comes to MIT. <laughs> and man, it's cold out there. <laughs> so, an old joke, by the way, but 
<laughs> it always works. So here we are. So the, we all know about biomass resources. I'll just flip through the statistics where we can get it from. It has to be grown sustainably. There's people working on, in various centers, the sustainable growth of, uh, of, uh, of biomass. And now the need to mitigate CO2 emissions. It's certainly not the cure-all for everything, but it will be part of the strategy that society has to face in controlling our CO2 emissions. So biomass conversion is, a, is an important part of the puzzle. In terms of catalytic processes, there is various uh, challenges that we have from a, a catalytic point of view, and that's where I'm coming from, and that we have to deal with molecules with multiple functionalities. This is very much unlike petroleum. Uh, they're going to pre predominantly operate in the liquid phase. That's not petroleum catalysis either. And this is an important problem, and many of the materials we'd like to work on as heterogeneous catalysts will leach into those liquid phases. And they have to be stable with respect to deposition of humans, hydrocarbons, various intermediates that don't come off the catalyst. Uh, and if we're going to make a product in the liquid phase, we have to separate it efficiently, effectively, cost effectively, out of the liquid environment. And we'll probably have to communicate with people doing techno-economics to get an, an idea whether the ideas we have actually have any chance of having any practical application. And I'll show you some examples of that. Here's a road map and where we've been for uh, a number of years in this conversion area, as, as, as Professor Hammond had outlined. Uh, we were doing aqueous phase reforming in, in the beginning, where we were taking the sugars, aqueous phase reforming, doing CC bond cleavage, making CO and hydrogen in water. And then with the water gas shift, we were making hydrogen and CO2 out of that. So that was the first thing we did in the conversion area. Then we learned how to bring on some CO cleavage along the way making hydrogen on board, but breaking CO bonds. We are now making alcohols and ketones and acids. These are all things that could undergo CC coupling reactions to build up the molecular weight. Now we can get into fuels. Once we remove the oxygen by making diesel, gasoline, and jet fuels, that was the whole virant story that we had heard about uh, you know, early on. Then in the Yuri Roman uh, era, we started looking at dehydration reactions. We are taking the xylose the furfural and furfural alcohol and libulinic acid, gamma valero lactone. And once you have GVL, you can do a selective decarboxylation to make butene, and then you can start building up uh, hydrocarbons. So we worked on that for a while. And then we did HMF. That's going to be part of our story that I brought on, and Ron Raines has worked in HMF. A lot of people have been fighting the HMF challenge, because once you have HMF, then you have access to all of this chemistry as well. So those, that's the furan space from the sugars. And I'm going to talk, uh, talk quite a bit about gamma valer lactone as a solvent and broaden it to other polar aprotic solvents for biomass processing. And here's just, a, in case you don't know, there's just a picture of what uh, GVL, gamma valer lactone, uh, looks like. And that's the Yuri story. So Yuri spent a lot of good years at, uh, at Wisconsin trying to develop methodologies for making HMF effectively. And we'll try to take his legacy and see how far we can take it in the future. OK, so we have a couple of challenges that I'm going to go through in, in the presentation. So a very brief vignette on how we can design catalysts that are active and selective for these polyfunctional molecules. The main part will be solvent uh, effects in reaction kinetics. That'll be the main story. Uh, and then a little bit that I might get to at the end is that these metal catalysts that we're going to be using are all working at very high coverage, uh, higher coverage than you would even see necessarily in a, in a gas phase reaction. And how does the coverage affect the reaction kinetics? It turns out it's quite important. So the first part now, very, maybe 10 minutes, 5 minutes, on some catalyst design for some of these uh, conversions. And here's an, an old reaction we got together on uh, the Center for Biorenewables at Iowa State. And the challenge was to take these, these cyclic ethers and do a, a ring opening hydrogenolysis to come up with these alpha omega diols that would be potentially valuable uh, chemical intermediates. And a class of molecules that work effectively for that are bifunctional, where you have a metal and then an oxophilic promoter. In this case, it was the rhodium, rhodium rhenium case. So here's the first stuff we had done in the area. These are going to be a series of molecules with various functionality. And you're going to see in this table, if we just kind of go through it, 
as we move down, this is the order of reactivity. And you can see they're ordered in decreasing reactivity. So these molecules are more active per, per gram of catalyst than these molecules. And then with Matt Newrock, a theorist at, uh, at Virginia, now at uh, Minnesota, he was looking at the carbonium, carbonium ion formation energies of the kinds of intermediates you would make by doing a selective cleavage of a carbon-oxygen bond. And it turns out now these molecules up here have relatively stable carbonium ion formation energies, whereas these molecules have less favorable carbonium ions. And the idea was that you had a combination of a metal and an acid functionality right next to each other that would achieve this effective uh, conversion. And here was just a plot then of the log of the rate versus the carbonium ion, oxyl carbonium ion formation energy. There appears to be a correlation. Again, these are the cyclic ethers that are quite active and selective. Now, the problem is when you put these metals together by typically impregnation, as we do in a, in a, in a catalyst, are the metals going to get together? Or are you going to have some isolated nanoparticles of different composition? So if we want to understand the nature of the site, we want to make a catalyst that has a, not only a narrow particle size distribution, but a narrow compositional distribution. Prior to doing that, though, let's look at this acid component. So if you look at, these are calculated deprotonation energies. And these are, if you put a hydroxyl group on a rhodium rhenium and then remove the proton, this is the deprotonation energy. Here it is compared to the pure metals, which are higher deprotonation energies, less acidic. These are the deprotonation energies of protons in zeolites and heteropolyacids that are known acidic materials. So the idea was that th these platinum rhenium, rhodium rhenium bimetallics are acidic in nature because as you remove the proton, the oxygen becomes more strongly held to the metal particle. That's why they're acidic. This is now that story on trying to make bimetallics that have a controlled compositional distribution. This is very simple organometallic chemistry, uh, very, uh, very straightforward in that we're going to take a rhodium catalyst as the parent, and we're going to now reduce it, put hydrogen on it. We're then going to take a, a, a commercially available organometallic compound. We're going to try, try to selectively find conditions where we can anchor it on the surface. We're then going to remove the ligands, and now we'll make bimetallic particles. A very, very simple thing that even us a chemical engineers can do in the lab. You can see here, here's evidence now. This is, these are the infrared spectra of CO adsorbed on rhodium silicon nanoparticles. And then you can see as you put on various amounts of molybdenum to cover the surface, you see a decrease in the bands due to CO on rhodium. These are the bands due to contiguous rhodiums. And you can see those are lost such that the rhodiums left behind are now isolated because they're surrounded by molybdenum. This has been an evidence now that we've selectively put the, the moly oxide moieties on the rhodium particle. These are electron particle size, electron microscopy particle size distributions. As you read through them, as we add more molybdenum, the size grows a little bit, but it doesn't come by modal. It remains unimodal. We've just increased the size a little bit by coating with molybdenum. And now these are going to be the, the dark field uh, stem uh, uh, st transmission electron microscopy images. And we do the mapping. You stop the beam on the individual particles, look at the composition. And then right here, you look at, do a histogram, not just of particle size, but of composition. These are two different catalysts that have been made. These arrows are what you get in composition from ICP, and you can see that the arrows pretty much fall in the, in the middle of the distribution, meaning that we have a fairly good uh, tight distribution of moly deposited, uh, in this case, onto platinum. That was the figure that I had, had, had pulled this from. And now here's the bottom line. Here's the ring opening, in this case, of the pyran ring in order to, to make the one selectively, the 1,6 hexane diol. And now we can see that the particle size, that the, as we add moly, to that, uh, to that uh, uh, particle uh, that we have an optimum rate at about 10% moly on the catalyst. So now we're coming up with now uh, well-defined particles in terms of size and composition for the selective biomass conversion reactions. And this is what Phages did in my group when he was at Wisconsin. He applied this methodology for doing water gas shift. It's not a biomass conversion. 
but he uses the, this approach very effectively for making platinum moly bimetallic catalysts. Okay, now the, the, the main part of the talk is going to be these liquid solvent effects. We've now made our bimetallic, and hopefully it's of uniform composition. Now let's see what the, what the solvent uh, has to do. So here's, we're going to be using GVL and others as our polar aprotic solvent for biomass conversion. And, and there she is again. So first, the first thing we did was, was the, our first evidence that we were onto something was in the conversion of hemicellulose into furfural as a platform molecule. So this is a relatively older piece of work now. These are in just a batch reactor. This is the furfural yield by a dehydration of xylose. In this case, we're using a, a solid mordenite catalyst. And you can see these are solvent GVL water mixtures that are 20% water and then less and less water. And you can see as we go drier and drier in the solvent, the reactivity speeds up uh, remarkably. So we're seeing this enhancement in reactivity as a function of the composition of the solvent. And this is the work, this is 2014, relatively old work. And now, if you look at the conversion of xylose to furfural, there's really four things that are going on, not from a mechanism, but just from a reaction engineering point of view. There's the dehydration to furfural. That's what we, try to, what we want to make. But furfural is a reactive molecule. It will undergo acid-catalyzed degradation. Furfural will condense with xylose to give degradation. And xylose can already uh, degrade on its own and not, not even get to furfural. So we looked at the reaction kinetics in batch reactors with different compositions and extracted rate constants from this. And you can see in water, these are the rate constants. I haven't given the units. These are the rate constants now in GVL water, 9 to 1 uh, mass ratio. And you can see right on the top, the desirable reaction of going xylose to furfural is sped up by 30 as we go drier and drier to GVL water. And the primary degradation reaction is step two. And that is not sped up at all. So this is evidence now that not only are we increasing reactivity, but we're turning on some reactions up more than others. And this allows us to now start tuning in selectivity as well as reactivity. So this led us to pursue this further because we had a dual benefit of working in these materials. So actually right now, the, uh, in that startup company, uh, you know, the, the glucan biorenewables. This is the reason why we're trying to, uh, uh, th th one of our applications is converting hemicellulose with 95% yield to furfural using exactly this approach, just as, a, as an aside. So that led us now to, to team up with, with Matt Nurock and my group to look at this effect in, in, the, in more detail uh, you know, last year. And then this, that's going to be some uh, ab initio molecular dynamics, which are very high level calculations that are rather demanding. And then in collaboration with a young professor, you know, uh, uh, Reed Van Len, uh, MIT, uh, bo uh, born and raised there, these are using mo classical molecular dynamics to see if we can look at and use these effects to understand bigger molecules. So that, this is kind of a two stories uh, kind of uh, melded in one. So these, this, is, this is the reactivity trend with, with, New, with New Rock. He wants a small molecule. So this is going to be butanol dehydration to butene. This is going to be the rate constant uh, of triphilic acid. Triphilic acid is fully ionized. So this is now per proton. We don't have to worry about the, the conjugate uh, base at this particular point. This is the rate constant in the mixture versus the rate constant in water divided by and this is in water, and this is now the mass fraction of GVL, and all the curves you're going to see. So in GVL, uh, this is how the, we, a slight decrease in reactivity followed by this precipitous increase in reactivity. Here we are in pseudonitrile, a relatively similar trend, so there's nothing magical about GVL. Okay, and now DMSO. DMSO is a widely st uh, studied solvent in biomass conversion. Here for, for, uh, for butanol, there's actually no enhancement. It actually is having a negative effect on the reactivity, which is a, a surprise to us. And dioxane used rather widely in making lignin from biomass. There's a, a, a loss, but then finally a gain, and then THF, a loss, and the, right at the end, there's a gain in reactivity. So this is the behavior of four, uh, of five, uh, of five solvents. Now it turns out, if you, without any further calculations, let's look at the heat of mixing. So this is now, uh, you're going to see these curves are the one, are, are the ones you just saw. And now in the green, that's the heat of mixing data. 
And what you're going to see for some of these solvents with the, with the white arrow, these are endothermic heats of mixing. Uh, and those are cases where typically the rate goes up. And there's a couple places with red arrows where the heats of mixing are exothermic. And those are typically places where the reactivity goes down. So there does seem to be some sort of a general trend in the solvent interactions between the polar or protic solvent and the water in terms of the reactivity profile for the butanol dehydration. So that was kind of an intriguing uh, direction for us. Now what we're really interested in is, is not uh, butanol dehydration, but our, our, our target reaction that you know, Ron Rains and Yuri were making HMF from fructose. So now what you're going to see is going to be the reactivity difference in what you saw with butanol versus what you now see the reactivity trend with fructose to HMF. And you can see in all of these cases, there's a stronger enhancement in the fructose to HMF reactivity compared to the butanol dehydration to butene. And even DMSO, which had been the outlier in showing low reactivity for butanol, now shows what we knew from the literature, very enhanced reactivity for fructose to, to HMF. So we're seeing an effect not only of the solvent, but on the nature of the reactant in terms of his, of his interaction with the solvent. And that's now explaining this, this change in selectivity that we had seen. So not all molecules are equally affected by the solvent. And if we understood that, that might allow us to design uh, effective solvents for rate and selectivity. Now comes in NUROC doing his ab initio molecular dynamic calculations. I'm just going to quickly go through. These are the barriers. These are the free energy barriers because entropy effects are just as important as enthalpic effects. These are the free energies now in, in looking at in DMSO for, the tertin, for butanol, there's an increase in the barrier, uh, which gives us low reactivity. With GVL, there's a decrease in the barrier that gives us higher reactivity. And then if you look now at what's happening in a solvent, this is the, the pairwise distribution function in these mixed solvents for the, uh, the, 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 the length between the center of the molecule and the water uh, uh, solvent uh, uh, clustering. And you can see now as you go, in, as you add dioxane going over to, from the red to the black, there's a bit of a clustering of the water around the butanol. This is a small effect right there. But if you look at xylitol, a much more hydrophilic molecule, now you see, compared to this case, a profound clustering of the water around the, the xylitol. This is because we have this hydrophilic molecule now in a solvent where the heat of mixing is endothermic, and now the water tends to be clustering around the reactant. And that's going to be leading to these higher reactivities that we were seeing. So it's no longer fair to think, as I had been, of the solvent as a uniform, uniform mixture. But actually, it's a clustering of one component versus the other, as probably all of you would have thought from the very beginning. So if you look at now at the pictures that uh, New Rock had put together in his publication, around the butanol, there's a hydrophilic domain. It's rather small, a hydrophobic domain around the opposite side of the molecule. But again, if you look at something like propane diol, it's a small molecule for him. We don't want to go to xylitol. We now see this larger apparent clustering around a more hydrophilic uh, reactive molecule. Now that led Van Len at Wisconsin to use classical molecular dynamics to look at a wider range of, of substrates. And the range from something xylitol, hydro, very hydrophilic, to something down here, which is rather hydrophobic. So there are seven molecules that were investigated. In each of these, he calculates this del parameter by looking at the periphery of the molecule in the, in the calculation and, ask, and asking what fraction of the surface of the molecule is a hydroxyl group versus a non-hydroxyl group. So that's his hydrophilicity parameter. And now these are the experimental data that we collected for him. In this case, we're going to be looking at this term sigma, which is just the log of the enhancement. So two means a factor of 100. That's all it is. We're now, in this first part, going to look at the solvent composition as we go in butanol for these different solvents of THF, GVL, dioxane, xylitol versus butanol, the open source of butanol. As you come in and add these three solvents, 
there is a decrease and not much enhancement in the rate of the butanol, whereas for xylitol, everything leads to enhancement. We kind of saw that before. And now for these seven molecules, this is put in the order of increasing hydrophilicity as measured by this del parameter. And now you can see as the del becomes more positive, we see a bigger enhancement in the reactivity difference because of this clustering behavior that we had, we had seen before. So if you take six of those molecules and now make a, a correlation versus various things, this is what worked out best for Van Len, the del, calculating the local density of water near the reactant, and then something with the hydrogen bonding lifetime in the calculation, other parameters, but these three gave a good descriptor for those sigma parameters you saw in all of those data, which are different solvents, different compositions, et cetera. And then if you use that training set to try to predict what fructose does, does a reasonable value. So this was now the idea that, and Huber was involved in this in our group, this was now the idea that you could use classical molecular dynamics to screen through solvents and try to predict solvent compositions that might be effective for increasing reactivity and therefore selectivity. They're working on that right now. But that's what this was, was leading to. Now that led us next to look at this known effect of chloride. We, we know that the HCl is typically more effective than sulfuric acid or even triflic acid actually in these biomass conversion processes. So we'd like to look at that. So this is something we did uh, just this year. Uh, again, we have a broad range of, of collaborators here. We have Nurock again. We have Rob Ryu in here, and then Brent Shanks, who was uh, part of the was leading the Iowa State Center. Uh, this had been going on for a few years. This culminated that collaborative effort. So what you're going to see right here now <coughs> are turnover frequencies for fructose conversion in triflic acid in water and hydrochloric acid. The red one is for the fructose conversion and then the, the green one is for HMF conversion. Okay, so this is now A going to B going to C where A is fructose, B is HMF, and then C is probably humans and the like. So you can see they're about equal and you pretty much get 40, 50% maximum yield of HMF from fructose in water. No effect of chloride that we can see right here. Okay, now we come to GVL water, and first of all, you see this enhanced reactivity. We just talked about that, okay? But what you mainly see right here is that the, in, the, in this particular case, when you, it, it, uh, there's, as you go from the triflic acid to HCl, there is now an increase in the, the reactivity of fructose and no increase in the reactivity of HMF. So this is now turning on selectivity for production of HMF. And in that GVL solvent, I think at that time our world record was maybe 70, 75 percent yield of HMF in GVL water with HCl from fructose, which I, I think at that point uh, we think was one of the, one of the best in the, in, the, in, in the literature. So these are a couple of plots now. We're going to look at the rate constant that we get as a function of the chloride concentration as we add chloride to triplic acid. This is a 90-10 GVL water, and it looks like it saturates. So it's like a Langmuir isotherm. It comes up and then lines out. There's an enhancement, maybe a factor of four. It's not a huge enhancement, but there is a noticeable enhancement, okay? Which is kind of have a shape a little bit like the fructose to HMF enhancement of reactivity, and we're wondering if those two phenomena are to some extent uh, uh, related. So now this is the effect of chloride at different water GVL ratios. And you can see right now, for example, in 5% GVL, so it's mainly water, you have to add a lot of chloride, actually. You hit saturation before you even see the effect, and it doesn't even go to saturation. However, as you go to more and more GVL, you come up more steeply. And actually, if we just zoom in this part right here, as you go to 75, 90% GVL, it takes a trivial amount of chloride, actually, oh, a trivial amount of chloride to lead to that enhancement. So there's an effect of the solvent composition, and if you like the equilibrium isotherm in a Langmuir expression for the chloride effect. So the rate enhancement then for the conversion is there's an inherent rate in the absence of chloride, there's the enhanced rate, maybe it's a factor of four or five, and then there's this curve, curvature effect where the KCL depends on the solvent composition. Now with Rob Riel, he had done some calorimetric data of maybe how fructose 
uh, the heat of uh, fructose dissolution was, uh, is affected. And uh, basically what you find out is that uh, if with and without chloride using triplic acid, there's no effect on the heat of dissolution. So based on the fructose reactant, there was no correlation with what chloride was doing. So that didn't seem to be the story. So the chloride appeared to be working with the transition state. And it was a reactivity effect that had to be understood. So again, bring in uh, Matt Newrock and his uh, ab initio density functional theory calculations. And here what you see then is as calculation, this is the free energy barrier for the highest barrier you have to go through. Here it is in water and adding chloride, there's really, there's really no effect. If you're in 75% GVL water, as you add chloride, there's a decrease in the barrier. As you go to 90% GVL, you add chloride, there's a decrease in the barrier. So it looks as if this is in fact a kinetic effect. It looks like it's in the transition state. And these are the pictures from the dynamics that NURAC would have, would have showed to us. What you're gonna see here is this is now gonna be the fructose and focus in then on, oh, on the, on the green right here. This, this is the, uh, the chloride uh, ion in solution. In water, it's just relatively far from the fructose. As you make the carbenium ion, okay, so as you protonate the OH group that you're gonna be removing from fructose, you have really a, uh, that's the protonate, that there's an, H, an H2O now positive bonded to the fructose. You can see in GVL water, the chloride tends to remain close to the, to the uh, positive charge. And now you see in a transition state, as that water is coming out, giving you the carbenium ion, then this chloride is, is acting as a good leaving group and acting really as a, as a hard conjugate base. So what's happening with the chloride is that unlike triphlic acid, which is completely dissociated, with HCl in these cases, the chloride and H stay relatively together. And now there is an effect of the, of the conjugate base in improving the ability to remove the, the, uh, the uh, H2O to make, give you the carbenium ion. So that it was explaining that, uh, uh, that particular effect. So having seen that, what I've tried to show you now is that GVL and these other solvents are effective for various things. So furfural, we worked on that many years ago. HMF, we've worked on more recently. And then even, as, as Professor Hammond had mentioned, this was kind of the origin of our biomass deconstruction methodology in trying to convert uh, cellulose into sugars. Uh, uh, we we're all using the GVL water. But in all of those cases, you do have to remove the product from the solvent to be effective. And that has been a big challenge, even that was plaguing the work that uh, Yuri had done. He had some very effective solvents, but it's, it was a challenge getting the HMF out of those in an effective way. So now, let me look at this article that uh, Ali had done in my group a couple years ago. And what you're gonna see here is if we take our, 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 our biomass and treat it in these water GVL, we're, we're, we're gonna add a co-solvent to it. In this case, we're gonna add in toluene, you're gonna find out. And if you cook the biomass in this temperature range, then actually you selectively remove and the, uh, the hemicellulose is xylose, and begin to convert that to furfural. The cellulose mainly stays together, and you, they'll pass that on to a biological person for a conversion. Or if you go up in temperature, then as Luderbacher had shown in my group, you're then going to react that to make, uh, to, make, uh, to make glucose. So that's the temperature range you're in. But if you're gonna be in this range and you put the sugar in GVL water, you do have to get it out of there, okay? How do you do that? That's what the toluene ends up doing. So if you just work in GVL water and you cool the solution back to room temperature, you see this monophasic goo, if you like, that has the humans in it and the sugars are in there, uh, for goodness sake, but uh, hard to remove. In contrast, if you, if you put in maybe 20% toluene, then at the reaction temperature it's monophasic, and as you cool it, it goes biphasic. And then you, what you have is an organic layer that has the toluene GVL, and then the sugars come down into the aqueous phase. And then in, in Ali's paper in Green Chemistry, he then looked at the extraction efficiency, which is then the mass of GVL extracted by the co-solvent divided by the mass of the solvent you've added in. Those are the bars, you want a high bar. 
And then there was this environmental score on what type of solvents would you use. Now I have to say, the first thing we tried was benzene. I guess I hadn't realized benzene's not so good. So then when we published the paper, we didn't put benzene in, but it was in the supplemental material. And then I did get a, uh, later on a note from the editor-in-chief, uh, Leitner, saying, why in the world did you ever let your students work with, with benzene? So anyway, the solvent of choice now that we're using is, in fact, toluene, which now gives us a relatively effective removal and phase separation. In our early work with Luderbacher, we used liquid CO2, which is very environmentally friendly, but actually has a low extraction coefficient and compression charges to use liquid CO2 is, is a bit of a, a nuisance. This, this co-solvent adding in a third component appears to be a pretty nice way of doing this conversion. So there's an idea of trying to design your solvent by mixing in petroleum. And here, these are the yields. This isn't just water GVL. That's what I did with Luderbacher. And now if you mix in the toluene, the yields of, of xylose, glucose, they're just as good, maybe better, without the need for liquid CO2 compression charges. So it's kind of a nifty uh, practical application. Now we come back to the HMF challenge. This is the, the, the stuff that, uh, that uh, year we get. So we can produce, I showed you, HMF in pretty good yield with, uh, with GVL. However, it's thermally unstable, and distillation is clearly not going to work here, and uh, we need to upgrade the, this HMF. Uh, without separating it. And now the, the question that Yuri asked, you know, is, is JD still working on HMF? And, and I guess, unfortunately, I have to say the answer was, was yes. But <laughs> we're still, still working on it, so let me just continue here. So we'll, we'll kind of be brief right here. This is now in using HCL. This is in the water GBL 50-50 mixture. You're going to see here plots then of the conversion and the yield. So here we can see we can make an HMF yield of maybe optimistically 70% using HCL. Now our goal is going to be to make FDCA, which is the diacid that presumably is an interesting uh, monomer for these renewable plastics that have very good desirable properties that have been talked about by Coca-Cola and Pepsi and everything. So actually if you add some FDCA, that's the diacid of HMF, in the medium, then you don't really change anything. You know, the, you still make your, your HMF at about the right amount, and the FDCA remains unreactive. So the FDCA is stable under these conditions uh, of the, uh, the, the fructose to, to HMF. That now led Ali to ask the question, do we even need HCL with its uh, own corrosion uh, issues. So here he just puts in the solubility limit of FDCA, which is not very high, by the way. And now as you see it it's slowed down, but again, you can see that the HMF yields are, you know, shooting over here at a quite acceptable level, so FDCA can be a catalyst for the conversion, okay. And then here's the, here's the, here's the trick now. So if you take the, the HMF in the GVL water, over just a standard platinum catalyst, you can oxidize it with high yield to FDCA. Okay, so now you're able to take the HMF, which you can't remove from GVL water, but you can oxidize it to the final product, FDCA, with, with high yield. That now leads to this simple curve right here. This is the solubility of FDCA in water and in 50-50 water GVL. And what you see then is that our oxidation temperature, 110, 120 degrees, that's where the platinum catalyst is doing its job. You can see there's a very high increased solubility of FDCA. That means your product now in the GVL water is soluble and it's not precipitating on the solid catalyst, which would be, would be a nightmare. But when you then pass the effluent out of the reactor and cool it down, solubility drops and it will precipitate out. So actually, this solvent choice gives you the reactivity you're looking for and then the separability. So in this way now, you can actually remove, you can get the H HMF out as, as FDCA. And that's the whole trick to this thing. And you can see right here in the bottom, by this process of heating and then cooling, we make a pure white at the end. We've actually used some activated carbon to pull out the humans. This is, we get 99.9% .9 pure FDCA crystals by this particular, particular approach. 
now with uh, Christos Maravellius, who's a systems person at uh, Wisconsin. He's done the techno-economics techno on this. And he would claim now that by this methodology, you could make FDCA at 1490 per ton. Now I have in my suitcase a few grams of it. And until I leave for the airport, I'm willing to sell this at 1375 <laughs> to anybody who would like to have it, only until I leave for the airport. And if you don't buy it, then I'll just throw it in the garbage anyway. So it doesn't matter. That's the bonus. <clears throat> now, the in the remaining five minutes, because I do want to uh, leave time for questions, this is something that's even simpler than this is removing as FDC. But actually, we can make the HMF pretty well going to a different solvent. And that's going to be simply using the uh, uh, acetone water. So acetone water works, works quite well. So this is now going to be what you saw, the enhancement in fructose reactivity in GVL water. Here's the curve in acetone water. It looks just about the same. If anything, there's a bigger enhancement. Again, another polar product solvent that's much less expensive than GVL. I mean, let's face it, GVL, even though it's biorenewable, you buy it from China, it's a, it's a nuisance to get your, get your hands on it. Acetone, much, much simpler. Volatile as well, so the separation of the HMF from the acetone water, much easier. And now I think Yuri might be impressed, maybe even Ron. These are, this is just the color of the, of the, in the little batch reactors that we use for the fructose conversion in the, uh, in the acetone water. And you can see up to 98%, if you were in, a, in water, this would be black with all the humans. You can now see our yields are at 95%, so they're just remarkably high. We should have done the acetone when Yuri was there. And I don't know why you didn't think of doing that, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I just want to make a point of that. I think so simple, Yuri. That right you sh should have told me that 20 years ago, but uh, fine. So it's working very, very well. And then even better is that you don't, uh, that was using HCL with this enhanced reactivity. Actually, even Amberlist uh, will give you pretty darn good yield so that you can actually flow this over a solid catalyst. There's no need to use a, a liquid catalyst where you have to manage the acid and remove it to make this darn thing. Ease of separation, good carbon balance. There's just some pictures of the effluents uh, right there. And again, techno-economics. Supposedly, we could make 1750. And again, same deal, 1643 if you want to buy your HMF from me. OK, having said that, the final thing I'll show that I'd like to uh, entertain any questions. I won't have time to get to this. The coverage effect is something we're doing with Mavrococcus uh, on the acetone uh, hydrogenation on platinum. I just want to show this curve right here. If you look at the reactivity data of acetone hydrogenation over a platinum silica catalyst, this is a function of the acetone partial pressure. And for reactivity people, the, 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 the blue is the data. It's remarkable, actually, in that the rate goes up significantly uh, as you go to lower uh, partial pressure. So it's kind of unheard of behavior from a Langmuir, uh, Langmuir Hinchwood, Haugen Watson like expression. Now, it turns out if you do the, your density functional theory calculations, all of Mavrococcus and people here, and you build in the coverage dependence of how the how the barriers and the binding energy change with coverage. And then you put that into your microkinetic model in solid equations with coverage dependent parameters. Then you get the, uh, the red thing, which is match. And, if you, and you make some adjustments, as always. So you, you match the data. Now, in contrast, if you take those barriers and binding energies that this adjustment has given you, and this coverage is around, I think, 0.4 or something like that. I forgot what the coverage is. And just lock the parameters there and run your microconductor models using Langmuir isotherms. So you have it adjusted, but you don't take into account the coverage dependence. You lock it in. Then you get a typical Langmuir expression where you predict that the rate comes down like this. Okay? So the bottom line here, and we, you know, for future discussion, is that in these microconductor models where the coverage becomes high, we all know you have to build coverage into your calculations, and almost, almost, almost everyone does that. But in the past, we had just locked in the parameters at that coverage and then used Langmuir isotherms. It turns out that's very misleading. And if you have data over a wide range of pressures like we do for acetone, it will give you misleading results. That was just a final take home. So I've exhausted your patience. 
I would like to thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted. I hope I wasn't a complete embarrassment, only a partial <laughs> embarrassment. That would be a success for me, by the way, <laughs> and the first time. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Before we go into questions, we have one more embarrassing presentation for you, Oh, my Jim. goodness. <laughs> so. I do have a laser, by the way, so. <laughs> so the tradition for the HODL lecture is to present a silver revere bowl as a representation of uh, our great uh, excitement in your receiving this lectureship award. Very oh. much for oh, th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> and in return, I have some colored chalk that I would like to thank like to so give. Much. Most welcome. Now we will take questions. Uh, we have uh, I have Mike and Maitland also, so we will get one right here. That was that was fabulous, Jim. Um, just one comment first, which is that uh, with ionic liquid systems, we also see a huge benefit to chloride ions. So I think it's pretty uh, universal. Mm -hmm. um, so I have actually two questions. One is um, when, you know, with proteins that bind to carbohydrates, there's a lot of information now suggesting that CH pi interactions are important. Do you see anything like that with the toluene um, data that you showed that, you know, you did these nice simulations earlier on? Do you ever do any simulations with? Toluene. No. Okay. No, we haven't. The toluene has been used in part, a separation strategy, but as right. a reactivity, yep. no, we haven't yep. investigated that. Okay. It'd be interesting to try. Uh, no. And what's your hypothesis about the amazing acetone water results? How is how is acetone helping that reaction? Is it forming some sort of hemi ketal with the yeah. hydroxyl groups and helping them leave? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. We're still we're kind of looking at that with Nurac right now. It, I mean, the enhancement is even more than the, than the GVL case. It's, it, I don't know. Yeah, it's I don't know. Amazing. Yeah, it is multiple beneficial effects, yeah. Question right here. Thank you for the amazing talk. I might miss that, but I'm wondering uh, if we look at into the clustering effect of water and how that would affect the acidic catalyst. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, again, in our case, all of our stuff is, is homogeneous. I mean, I saw yesterday some of the work here from the Roman group in looking at zeolites and all the complex things happening there with the solvent. We're just looking at the, at the protons. So what, so what you see then is because of this water clustering around the hydrophilic reactant, it tends to bring and, and concentrate the proton at the reactant and then in the transition state. So that's what you're seeing that leads to this higher reactivity. Additional questions. Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, a, but, a, but a simple one. A simple one. <laughs> <laughs> That's my hope. Well, something, you know, you, you show that you always need a little bit of water because then if you go to 100% of a solvent, then the rate drops again, right? So there is a maximum at, at which you have a little bit of water that is needed. Yeah. And do you know what that limit is and why it would exist? Or where, when does it break, I guess, the enhancement? I don't know. And the fact is that when you don't have any water, you lose your solubility. So in, in, these, uh, in these fructose cases, for example, there's, there's hardly any solubility in the absence of water. Really? Even with GVL, you have low solubility? Low solubility, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Low solubility. So we haven't pushed to very, very dry conditions. So any data we have that's very, very dry, I'm not sure about the reliability of those data, whether it does come down or we have not investigated that. So I wonder if there's clustering also of the sugar molecules, you know, in addition to the water, yeah. and they form this more macroscopic, not macroscopic, but, you know, more clustering of Could the reactants. Could be. This is very, very low solubility, right, well. exactly. I mean, that's why you saw with, with the stuff with the FTCA, we had backed off the 50-50 water GVL, not because it gave better results, but at 90, 95, but we couldn't get enough sugar in there, so then in the technical economics, we're, we're so dilute. So then we went 50-50, so we had 
enhanced reactivity, but sufficient solubility that we can load up sugar in the mixture and get, and get high enough concentration of FDCA that it will precipitate out, you know? So you're fighting solubility with low water. Yep. Same in acetone water, you fight solubility. Very nice talk. Um, this is not my field, but I remember you showed a little bit earlier when you had the xylose going to, I guess it was the HMF, and you showed that when you put GVL in there, you saw that the rate went up for the kinetic rate one, but also yeah. kinetic rate four, the xylose decomposing the products yeah. went up at the, to the same amount. So how does that play out? Yeah, <clears throat> it, yeah they went up by the same amount. The, the only good thing was that the primary degradation pathway was that step two. So if it would have been, I think it was step four, yeah. uh, then there would have been no enhancement yeah, that's, in that's the selectivity. Ex yeah. You're exactly right in that case. Luckily, even though that went up, it was a, still a minor yeah. pathway. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Great talk. So physically, what dictates or governs solubility? Well, it's, it's, it, it's the the, the interaction of uh, you have the hydroxyl groups with the with the sugar that are interacting with water and that's driving the solubility. Whereas when you have the these polar and protic solvents, there's very limited interaction between the the solvent and the hydroxyl groups and you have low solubility. So that's the interaction. So salvation energy or salvation, yeah. Mm -hmm. What yeah. about dynamics? I have no idea what the dynamics. I don't know. Following up on, on Yang's question, uh, what is the role of electrostatics here? So as you change the solvents, you're changing the you know effect of permittivity and, and sort of simple estimates of solubility. You know, for let's say the chlorides, you know, is obviously pretty sensitive to uh, local delta constant. Do you have any any simple models for the for the solubility or that just comes straight from the DFT? Yeah, that's, this is from the DFT, really at infinite yeah. dilution, okay. essentially. So that's that's what this is. Yeah. Any other questions, including those from students? We have a number of students in the audience. Or postdocs. I had a general question uh, for you, Jim, which is uh, with respect to the field of biodegradable, biodegradable plastics, which is one that uh, those of us in the polymer field are very interested in. Uh, what do you think are the barriers to getting to products that are going to be um, essentially landfill, you know, erasable, so to speak, in short time frames. You know, <clears throat> no, I think I think the barrier is is getting these potential monomers to polymer people to make their materials. So right now, as as Ron and other people know, if you're going to buy HMF, it's going to be expensive to come up enough material that you would make something, look at its physical properties, and whether it has any desirable uh, property compared to a, a petroleum derived material. So with some of the things now with the HMF here, with the acetone water, I mean, I, I think we can, I can, we can make this stuff relatively easily. Any lab can make it. So I think that barrier to getting into the right hands of polymer physics, polymer materials people, I hope will lead to some better materials that are, that, that would be my, my goal. Excellent. Any additional questions? Uh, uh, following up on your answer, um, have you tried tandem uh, polymerization as you are making the HMF? Or no. Okay. No, we have not. We have not. All right. If we have no further questions, okay. let's thank our speaker one last time. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.